streaming the Parliament Channel 11. Also broadcasting on 105.5. Honourable the Speaker. Almighty God, we give thanks to you, the creator of the universe, and humbly beseech you to direct and prosper the deliberations of the members of this house here assembled for the advancement of your glory and the trust and welfare of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Grant that peace and happiness, truth and justice may be established among us for all generations. Amen. Amen. Namaste. Oath or affirmation, announcements by the speaker. Honorable members, Mr. Prakash Ramada, MP, member for St. Augustine, has asked to be excused from today's sitting of the House. The leave which the member seeks is granted. Bills brought from the Senate, petitions, papers. The Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have the honor to lay the following papers. The Consolidated Financial Statements of the Petroleum Company of Trinidad and Tobago Limited for the year ended September 30th, 2016. Papers two to three, the report of the Auditor General of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago on the financial statements of the Port of Spain Corporation for the years ended September 30th, 2009 and 2010. Four, the report of the Auditor General of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago on the financial statements of the Point Fourteen Civic Center for the year ended September 30th, 2006. Five to six, the report of the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago with respect to the progress of the proposals to restructure CLECO, BAT, and CIB for the quarters ended March 31st, 2017 and June 30th, 2017. Seven, the ministerial response of the Treasury Division Ministry of Finance to the fourth report of the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee on an examination of the system of internal audit within the public service. Madam Speaker, I beg to move that paper one be referred to the Public Accounts Enterprises Committee and papers two to four be referred to the Public Accounts Committee. Honorable members, the question is that paper one be referred to the Public Accounts Enterprises Committee, and papers two to four be referred to the Public Accounts Committee. All in favor say aye. aye. Any against? The ayes have it. Leader of the House. Thank you very kindly, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I have the honor to lay papers eight to 11. These represent the responses to the fourth report of the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee on the examination of the system of internal audit within the public service. 
These responses are from the Treasury Division, Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Labor and Small Enterprise Development, the Elections and Boundaries Commission, the Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries, and the Ministry of Public Utilities. Thank you very kindly, Madam Speaker. The Minister of Community Development, Culture and the Arts. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I have the honor to lay the annual administrative report of the former Ministry of Community Development for fiscal 2013-14. The Minister of Housing and Urban Development. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have the honor to lay the annual administrative report of the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development for 2014 to 2015. The Minister of Trade and Industry. Madam Speaker, on behalf of the Minister of Trade and Industry, I have the honor to lay paper number 14, the annual administrative report of the Evolving Technologies and Enterprise Development Company Limited for the year ended September 30th, 2016. Thank you very kindly, Madam Speaker. Reports from committees. The member for Karani East. Madam Speaker, I have the honor to present the following report. The ninth report of the Public Accounts Enterprises Committee on the examination of the audited accounts, balance sheet, and other financial statements of the Telecommunication Services of Trinidad and Tobago Limited for the financial year 2015, 2008 to 2016, 2008 to 2016. Urgent questions. The member for Naparima. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To the Minister of National Security, could the Minister state the reasons for the failure of our intelligence services to anticipate and plan for the events which unfolded yesterday on the Beatham Highway in the wake of the arrests of two residents of the area? Minister of National Security. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, let me publicly state that the government of Trinidad and Tobago definitely condemns the action of any lawless activities on the part of our citizens. With respect to what happened in the BTM yesterday, we have proposed a zero tolerance of any type of behavior that will affect the peace-loving persons, citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, and also empathize with those who went through those traumatic experiences yesterday. Madam Speaker, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service had an operation in the BTM yesterday. And early this morning, the Commissioner of Police identified there was a, a gap in terms of the operation. That gap has to do with the, not only just the response, but in terms of the timeliness of that response. Madam Speaker, the police intervened to arrest two individuals in the Beatham yesterday on a mounted operation. They were, in fact, on the ground at the time of the incident, had to call for reinforcements, which they did, and dealt with the matter as quickly as possible to bring relief to the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker. Member for Naprima Supplemental. Can the Minister, can we be assured, Honorable Minister, that what occurred in 1990, caused in part by a result of faulty intelligence, will not reoccur? Madam Speaker, there is no comparison with 1990 and what happened yesterday, but I can assure you that even based on lessons learned from 1990, the agencies of the state I've put together an intelligence agency that can treat with any matters put in into 1990. And with respect to the operation yesterday, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service has, learned, has done lessons learned and they will treat with any matter in the future, well prepared to treat with any eventualities, Madam Speaker. Major question. The Minister says that uh, 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 systems were put in place based on the lessons learned in 1990, respect to intelligence gathering. Why did we not see them in effect yesterday? Minister of National Madam Security. Speaker, again, I said there are two different matters. There are different levels of intelligence that are related to the different kind of events. And therefore, as I said, and I will continue to say, the agents of the state are well prepared to treat with any eventualities again and prepared to ensure that there is not a reoccurrence of what happened yesterday in Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker. Member for Carney Central. To the, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. To the Minister of National Security. Could the Minister please share with this House the Trinidad and Tobago Police Services assessment of the reason or the reasons for the eruption and disruptive and violent behavior in Beatham yesterday. 
Minister of National Security. Madam Speaker, thank you. With respect to the incident at the BTM yesterday, while there are numerous uh, reasons that can be preferred based on the incident from a law, in law enforcement perspective coming from the Trinidad Police Service, it was directly based on the Trinidad Police Service arresting two individuals in the BTM and the reaction from the citizens in support of those individuals, Madam Speaker. From purely from a law enforcement perspective, as the question determined, Madam Speaker. Member for Karani Central, supplemental. Thank you, Madam Speaker. What, what explains the reaction of the community or the people not actually affected by the police arrests of individuals? Minister of National Security. Madam Speaker, the Trinidad Police Service are continuing to investigate in, with respect to the reasons and take actions on those who have committed offenses with respect to the protest actions that they beat them yesterday, Madam Speaker. Member for Kumutu Mantinello. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Minister, with the Ministry of National Security, we reassess the need to put the helicopters back in place in light of the fact that there's disruptive behavior. Sorry, could you repeat? Will the Ministry of National Security reassess the need to put the helicopters back into commission as a result of this disruptive behavior? Madam Speaker, the Ministry of National Security has helicopters in its arsenal and they would use them as a team fit depending on the situation. Madam Speaker. Member for Karani East. Honorable Minister, how do you intend to deal with the fears and apprehension of Question the. Three. Huh? Question, Question three. Question. Oh, I thought. All right, fine. To the Prime Minister, Honorable Prime Minister, under what legal authority did the Prime Minister give direct instructions to the Commissioner of Police, as he publicly did at a press conference today? So. Thank you much, Madam Speaker. As has been happening since September 2015, the Honorable Prime Minister is the Chairman of the National Security Council, which meets on a very frequent basis. And having regard to what we saw happen yesterday and the need for the citizens to be assured that this government continues to take positions of leadership, the Prime Minister met with the members of the, some of the members of the National Security Council and he gave those directions to the Commission of Police today. Is it that you're suggesting this should have been done privately? We have done it, the Prime Minister did it today for the public of Trinidad and Tobago and with the full authority to do so as the Chairman of National Security Council. And once again, it just shows how a former administration may have operated before taking no leadership role whatsoever with national security matters. Member for Orupuchi. Thank you for the lucid clarification. Um, could the Prime Minister indicate to us when was this uh, meeting of the National Security Council held? Member for Orupuchi West. To the Minister of Education, in light of the non-renewal of contracts of some 150 IT technicians, could the Minister please state what other measures will be implemented to support the IT needs of primary and secondary schools in Trinidad and Tobago? Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I first of all would like to correct the member for Oaputu West on two counts. First of all, there are 100 IT technicians on our establishment, not 150. And the second count is, we have not failed to renew any contract for any IT technician. What has happened is the IT technicians are at present on month to month contracts and we are looking at appraising the performance of these IT technicians with a view to decide what is the best number of IT technicians that can support our IT program. Thank you very much. Member for Old Pooch West Supplemental. How long will this performance appraisal or appraisal take place? How long? Minister of Education. Madam Speaker, before the end of this school term, that will be completed. Member for Old, uh, Member for Carney, is? Subsequent to your pro, uh, appraisal, would these IT technicians be giving month-to-month uh, -month contract or full three-year contract? Minister of Education. Subsequent to the appraisal, Cabinet has decided that they will award three-year contracts to those persons. 
Member for Carney East. To the Minister of Education, why has the Ministry of Education not paid the school feeding program caterers the outstanding monies owed to them, despite, Honorable Minister, your recent promise to ensure payments? Minister of Education. Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to announce that we have, re we have received releases from the Ministry of Finance, and very shortly, all the caterers who provide services to our school children, they will be paid. Thank you. Member for Carney, East Supplemental. Give a, a comforting assurance to the, these caterers as to when the payments will be made to them. Minister of Education. Madam Speaker, this morning, in discussion with our senior officers at the Ministry of Education, it was decided that in a matter of days, these caterers will be paid. Thank you. Member for Carney, East. You'll be paying all the money outstanding to the caterers. Minister of Education. I am not in a position to state whether all the money owed will be paid. All I can say is a substantial amount was received by the Ministry of Education, which should satisfy the needs of the caterers. Member for Orpuch West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To the Minister of Education, in light of the recent breaking at Hillview College on Monday, can the minister indicate how his ministry intends to ensure the safety of students and the security of equipment at the school? Minister of Education. Madam Speaker, Hillview College is a denominational school. That school receives a grant from the government to provide security services. Almost every day, I am on the compound of Hillby College, and I'm assured that the security services are well taken care of. Only today, in speaking with some of the security officers when I visited the school, I have been assured once more that the security needs of the school are being met. Thank you. Member for Carney Central. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. To the Minister of National Security, what plans, if any, Minister, has, what plans, if any, has the Minister put in place to address fear, safety, and security concerns of the citizenry, given that the Christmas season is almost upon the country and the obviously deteriorating crime situation in the country? National Security. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the Minister of National Security continues to reinforce that strategic pillar of prediction and deterrence, not only during the Christmas season, but throughout the, the, year, of, the year 2017, continuing in 2018. Madam Speaker, as a result of that reinforcement, the Commissioner of Police has, in fact, uh, will continue to increase, not during the Christmas season, into the carnival, <coughs> increase the presence of Trinidad and Tobago Police Service to joint operations with the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force on our highways, and our shopping centers, and our malls. And additionally, Madam Speaker, there would be an increase in DUI testing. There would be also an increase in speed management. As you're well aware, we have just received nine additional speed guns provided to Trinidad Tobago Police Service. There would be an increase in speed management on the roads and highways. We've also, as part of our effort, incorporated the Trinidad Tobago uh, Custom, the Customs and Excise Division because at the Christmas season, there's an influx of a number of uh, goods and services coming in Trinidad and Bago to increase the vigilance, especially the movement of illegal goods coming through the port. So we incorporated the customs also as part of our border management um, control system. So customs, Trinidad and Bago Police Service, Trinidad and Bago Defense Force would be actively involved in measures to, be, to, to ensure a safe and secure environment for the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, Madam Speaker. Member for Carney, Central Supplemental. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Will citizens be able to have a sense of high visibility of police presence during the Christmas period 
And well, the speaker will tell me not two questions, so I'll ask afterwards. Sir, National Security. Madam Speaker, as I mentioned a while ago, there will be high visible, visibility of the Tranmigo Police Service, supported by the Tranmigo Defence Force, on our highways and our shopping centres and our malls and so on. And you'll see additional efforts being placed, as I said. We included the customs as part of that to ensure a safe and secure environment. Central. Will this proactive action continue into the carnival season? Minister of National Security. Yes, Madam Speaker, it will continue. Member for Naparima. Minister of Health. Given Wednesday's extensive flooding in Barpo, could the Minister state the specific steps which he intends to take to prevent the spread of leptospirosis and other waterborne diseases in the area? Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you for the question. The Ministry of Health started its rainy season public awareness campaign in July of 2017. It continued post Brett, it continued post the Diwali Day flooding. Specific actions taken post Diwali, the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Nandrum of Insect Vector, and Mr. Rampasa, Chief Public Health Inspector, mounted a media campaign to alert. With specific reference to this Wednesday's flooding, the Principal Medical Officer of Environmental Health, working in conjunction with the Chief Medical Officer, will has already embarked post Diwali on a public education program. Specific measures also include under the offices of the County Medical Officer of Health to liaise with the regional corporations to do flushing and washing of hard surfaces like roads and yards in and around homes. Once that is done, insect vector then moves in and sprays for, with bacteri uh, bactericides for both leptospirosis. We also treat for mosquitoes, both for the larvae and adult mosquitoes. We also advise residents how to dispose of the carcass of dead animals that may have died in the floods, how to handle um, vegetables. I must say, that there's a human element to this. While we can spar across the aisle, one person who got leptospirosis came into contact with floodwaters because his car was stalled on Mosquito Creek. At that time, a human being, a father, a husband, will put himself in danger. That's a human element that we miss sometimes, no matter how much we warn people. And we have to be aware of this, that sometimes, coming into contact with floodwaters may be inevitable, but we continue to alert the population and advise them, and once we have a suspected case, we treat them with antibiotics. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Member, question time is now spent. Questions on notice, questions for oral answer. Honorable Members, in accordance with Standing Order 2914, the member for Naparima has requested that the House of Representatives question number 17 listed on today's order paper be withdrawn. Leader of the House. Right. Madam, Madam Speaker, I'm really disappointed because we are very ready to answer question number 17. I'm surprised that it's been withdrawn. A question about the spotlight. I didn't want to ask it again. Anyway, Madam Speaker, I'd like to indicate that of the three, question, the three oral questions that have been asked, we will answer all three of the seven written answers that have questions that have been asked. We will answer all seven. Member for Shagonas West. Thank, thank you, Madam Speaker. Question number 14 to the Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the Honorable Member for Shibonis West is inferring by his question that the Trinidad and Tobago Hospitality and Tourism Institute has not been receiving gate funding. This is patently untrue. During fiscal 2017, the TTHTI was paid the sum of 2729000 $492 in respect of students at the Institute who were eligible for gate funding. The Ministry of Education is currently processing claims from the TTHTI for gate funding 
totaling $1,571,800. Since payment of these claims is subject to the, to the availability of funds, I am unable at this time to give a time frame for the settlement of these claims. Thank you. <coughs> Member for Naparima. To the Minister of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs. Could the Minister give the expected no, time? Just question number 19. Oh, sorry. Question 19 to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Thank you very much. Leader of the House. Oh, Minister of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs. I'm sorry. Madam Speaker, the government of Trinidad and Tobago is cognizant of the imperative for ambitious and urgent global action to address the unsustainable trajectory of global temperature increase. To this end, Madam Speaker, Trinidad and Tobago signed the Paris Agreement on the opening day of signatures on the 22nd of April 2016, thereby symbolizing this country's continued commitment to multilateral action and support of the United Nations framework on climate change to treat with the problem. The government is aware that ratification is the next natural step in the process and as such is seized with the issue. The matter is accordingly receiving due attention, Madam Speaker. Where that there was a UN high-level pledging conference building a more resilient uh, climate resilient Caribbean community at which 1.3 billion US in pledges and 1 billion in loans and debt relief took place earlier this week. And because we are not ratifying, we are losing out on a number of possible assistance. The question? Minister of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs. Madam Speaker, allow me to thank you profusely so the member for making that awareness available. We as a responsible government on this side of the house follow these matters closely and uh, would take the necessary steps to attract resources to treat with any problems that might arise in this area. Thank you. Member for Naparima. <laughs> Question 20 to the Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Madam Speaker, the Ben Lomond Government Early Childhood Care and Education ECC Center and the Reform SDMS ECCE Center are both approximately 89%, 98% completed, while the Reform SDMS Hindu Primary School is approximately 86% completed. Works on all three facilities have been suspended by the respective contractors due to non-payment of invoices. The Ministry of Education is actively seeking to identify funds to meet outstanding payments and the cost of completion of the facilities. In these circumstances, Madam Speaker, I am not currently in a position to provide the proposed opening dates of these facilities. Thank you. Member for Karani East, supplemental. Is the same approach towards completion of these three schools being adopted for the completion of the other 75 that were under Hello. construction? Hello. Supplemental question, Member for Karani East. Request for leave to move the adjournment of the House on definite matters of urgent <coughs> public importance. Member for Shagonas West. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I, I hereby request your leave, understanding order 17, to move a matter of urgent public importance, namely the failure of the government to protect citizens from the lawlessness that occurred on the highway in the vicinity of Beecham Gardens. The matter is definite because it specifically refers to the terror, trepidation, and trauma suffered by motorists and citizens yesterday as they proceeded on their commute to and from the capital city <coughs> of Port of Spain. The matter is urgent because motorists and citizens were subjected to being shot at, pelted and stoned while seated in their vehicles and there, and there is a tangible fear that this will reoccur. The matter is of public importance 
because the failure to provide safety and security to commuters on this main artery strikes terror on all citizens and is an attack on the Constitution, which guarantees freedom of movement. Honorable members, I am not satisfied that this matter qualifies under this standing order. I advise that the member pursue this matter under standing order 16. Statements by ministers, personal explanations, introduction of bills, motions relating to the business or sittings of the House and moved by a minister, public business, private members' business, motions. Member for Oropuch East. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, I beg to move the following motion standing in my name. Be it resolved that the House take note of the continuing failure of the government to implement a viable housing policy to provide affordable housing units to qualified and deserving citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, the motion before us today attempts to meet and treat with a critical need by citizens throughout the length and breadth of Trinidad and Tobago. The housing sector, Madam Speaker, is possibly one of the most important areas for public policy intervention, not only because of the dire need to provide housing, which I think all elected members of parliament are more than aware of, but Madam Speaker, the housing sector is a foundation for economic development, income redistribution, prosperity, and the sector itself, Madam Speaker, contributes 90% or more to the construction sector, which is an engine of growth for Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, it has always been so. And while the infrastructure development through the Ministry of Works and Public Utilities and so on do contribute and do play a big part in infrastructure development, it is the housing sector that drives economic development and drives income redistribution. So much so that in the year 2013 or thereabout, the then leader of the opposition, the member for Diego Martin West, made a public statement suggesting that the entire government was being run from the Ministry of Housing. But it was, Madam Speaker, a Ministry of Housing that had other entities in it apart from the HDC. And today, I want to speak of the importance of the sector to economic development. And when this sector, Madam Speaker, is weak, when this, this sector is injured for any reason, when we have policy distortions that reflect itself, in non-implementation of programs, when we have institutional weakness, the economy suffers. And I think all members of this House, and particularly the government, have been speaking about the importance of sustaining economic activity and development, given what they believe to be their economic challenges. Madam Speaker, I will not take the limited time that is available to me to spend time and rehash the past or give an account, statistical account, of what was done from 1962, 1995, 2001, 2010, and so on. But just to indicate that we are quite prepared on this side to protect and defend our track record in the housing sector as being one of the areas that brought development, that brought care and compassion the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, in the housing sector, the flagship state enterprise is the Housing Development Corporation that is governed by Chapter 3303. And in this Housing Development Corporation Act, Madam Speaker, that governs the flagship state enterprise, there's a reference to minister. And I want to put on record very early our understanding of that. Minister means the member to whom responsibility for the Trinidad and Tobago Housing Development Corporation is assigned. Unless we are mistaken, we verily believe the member for San Fernando East is that minister responsible for the Housing Development Corporation. Madam Speaker, 
The Housing Development Corporation, Ark, I also want to say as part of my introduction, I believe it is section 13, Madam Speaker, speaks to the mandate of the HDC. And that mandate, Madam Speaker, deals with the matter of functions and duties of the corporation. And I'll just read 13.1a, Madam Speaker. To do all things necessary and convenient for and in connection with the provision of affordable shelter and associated community facilities for low and middle income persons. There are times, Madam Speaker, when we forget middle income and we carry, we carry a battle over housing for low income. And while that is clearly a focus of every government, we sometimes forget that those who drafted this bill, incidentally, the People's National Movement government in 2005, had the intention of the HDC and the housing sector, public housing sector, providing shelter for middle income persons. Because we have been accused over the years, the last two years or so, of providing for only middle or not providing for lower income citizens. When that, Madam Speaker, is of course the mandate of the HDC. Madam Speaker, in, in passing, really, I just wanted to make a few observations. Over the years, Madam Speaker, we have had certain myths about housing developing, and the member for San Fernando is, if it is the member for San Fernando is who responds to this motion, I am not sure. Um, the member for San Fernando is, and others, over the years, you know, we have spoken about low-cost housing. And I just wanted to put some statistics gathered from the Housing Development Corporation data. Madam Speaker, during the period 2002-2009, under a PNM government, there were 13,047 housing starts. Madam Speaker, it is reported that during 2002 to 2009, that administration delivered, that administration completed and delivered 2,428 housing units in seven years. Madam Speaker, I repeat that. There was a delivery between 2002 to 2009 of 2,428 completed housing units, but 13,047 13, housing starts. That is indeed a lot of housing starts, I might add. Madam Speaker, the second fact I want to put on the table is the People's Partnership in five years executed 7,130 housing starts and delivered, and delivered 8,521 housing units in five years, Madam Speaker. It should be noted that the housing program is an ongoing program, and the figure of delivery of the partnership will include the completion of units commenced under the former administration. So by 2010 or 2011, we were distributing homes in, in, in current settlements in Madeline, in um, Coover, uh, Carson Field, and so on. That was indeed started before us by a previous PNM administration. Likewise, today the member for San Fernando East he goes, he presents his keys to persons to go to live in Fairfield, Princess Town, Egypt, Shaguanas, um, and Union Hall, and so on, built by the People's Partnership. So it is an ongoing process. And Madam Speaker, nothing is wrong with that at all. Um, and, and, and we thank them. Madam Speaker, when we came in office in 2010, we had real problems here. We had real problems to deal with. And I will, I will just run it through quickly. I don't want to spend time on it. Madam Speaker, in several of these estates, there was no waste treatment plant. There was no infrastructure. There was no provision for playgrounds, community centers, and so on. And work was done during that period. We had, we had to go into the housing sector and almost, I think, 33 estates. We had to do remedial work. And one alone in Wellington and South Trinidad, we expended $20 million on rehabilitation work with infrastructure because we discovered that the homes were moving. They were simply moving. They moved by six inch to eight inches. They were moving down a hill because not proper infrastructure work was done. Madam Speaker, the government at the time had built a lot of these estates on cane lands. And while to facilitate planting cane, you do ratooning and so on, when you are building house, it, it, it requires greater infrastructure and a more focused emphasis on infrastructure. And we had to deal with that in Retrench. We had to deal with that in Wellington. We had to deal with that in Coover and, and so on. So, Madam Speaker, we have a proud record that we can speak at length on, but I will not speak at length on. 
Madam Speaker, the other matter related to this is that we had some projects that were so sick that they required more than remedial work. It required, in some cases, investigation, contractual problems, and those would include the famous Las Alturas, which I think everybody knows about that now, Las Alturas. But there are also problems in Harmony Hall, Wellington. There are two towers standing in Shaguanas. When you pass there, you will see them. They are still there. Um, regrettably, in the five years, we made some advance to issue a contract, but it was not completed. I don't know if we may go back and complete it. Um, but that is in Shaguanas. That is still standing as testimony to a sick project. And there are several others. We had a problem in Viewfort, I believe, in the Northwest, where a decision was taken to expand a housing estate without tongue and country approval. In fact, in many of those uh, developments, there was no tongue and country approval, no EMA approval, and sometimes there were no board of directors approval. Would you believe, Madam Speaker, over $1 billion in variations had to go back to an HDC board to approve because they were made, variations were done without board approval. Hmm. 54 cases went back to the board and they were done uh, for $1 billion in variations. In one case, I think it is in Viewfort, there was no community consultation. Do you know the HDC erected buildings and then the neighbor took them to court? It lasted about eight years because the neighbor claimed that it was blocking, the buildings were blocking the light. So eight years, we couldn't finish that. I think the court matter ended a year or two ago, and that has finished. So good, good work there. So we have had all these problems. And I, again, I don't want to spend too much time on them. You can take too much time and spend on that. Madam Speaker, when we were there, we were very proud that we had a program called It's Been a Long Time Coming, where for persons who applied 15 years and over, and I want to say, you give some credit where credit is due. That was the idea I inherited from my predecessor. Um, what is her name again? D. Big C. Um, um, Emily Dickford, Minister of Housing at the time. And I inherited that idea from her, and we implemented it, and we had several distributions for persons 15 years and over. In one case, a man was waiting 45 years for a house. He got it. Mr. Bell in Central, I remember his name. Mr. Dell. I told him they had to name a computer after him while he was waiting. <laughs> Madam Speaker, we had a program for differently abled. We met and treat 100 differently abled persons receive housing, and those houses were specially designed for them. We met and treat with the police, with the protective services, with the Public Service Association. We had an arrangement as part of their collective agreement process and so on. So every sector... We did random draws, televised random draws, and we were moving along in that line. Uh, to this day, I'm not sure whether in the last two years we have had a random televised random draw for housing, but the minister has a latitude to distribute homes pursuant to the cabinet decision. So I'm not, I'm not really focused on that. So Madam Speaker, the, the housing record under the People's Partnership culminated with the amazing 100 homes a week distribution program that continued uninterrupted for about three months. Madam Speaker, they couldn't believe it because HDC staff were working morning, noon, and night, Saturday, Sunday, to ensure people got the keys in their hands. And whatever anybody could say about that, people got their keys, they went in their home. Madam Speaker, it is not a day goes by, and I want to say with, with, with pride too, not a day goes by that I don't walk in this country through a mall, at the gym, in a, in a market somewhere, or in other places, and somebody don't come up to me and shake my hand and say, thank you very much when you were in office, I got a home. And that, Madam Speaker, is a rewarding experience. And not only the CEO of the EMBDC, um, Madam Speaker, but we'll come to that in a little while as well. Madam Speaker, two major problems erupted in the last few days, both linked to housing, and I'll explain it. The areas that are crime hotspots are deemed to be, that have the biggest amount of fear from bandits and violent crime and so on. Do you know several of these areas are called HDC community clients? They are clients of the HDC. When we were in office, we met and we treated with persons on the BTAM, in Lavantil, in Mova, in those areas where we believe that they, they, there was a need for participation, for interaction, for bringing the communities in. 
Today we read in the papers, Madam Speaker, in The Guardian, I think it is now, residents afraid to return home, police evict illegal Clifton Towers tenants again. Madam Speaker, when we were there, there were two things happening. One, an annual uh, uh, program to refurbish and fix those areas in which HDC people are around now, Christmas in particular, because we wanted to create some jobs for Christmas as well, whether it's Color Me Orange or another program, we go into the communities, mobilize everybody for work because buildings need to be paint, painted, light bulbs need changing, grass need cutting, work needs to be done. We mobilize the communities. And that helped a lot to keep people together. We had, Madam Speaker, a management committee in Clifton Towers that worked with us. When one person invaded a home, we found out, we sent HDC security. I asked the minister to tell me over the last two years, has, do you have a head of HDC security yet? Because there was a time when HDC don't have a head of security. This is why the situation erupted at Clifton Towers. So we worked with the communities, Madam Speaker, we worked with them. In Beatum, we went there with the basketballer, what was his name? Um, who? Tall. Shaquille O'Neal. Shaquille O'Neal, Madam Speaker, I don't bump ball and thing, but I know of these basketball players, and we took him there to launch the Hoop for Life. The entire beatum came out. We completed a building, cut the ribbons. Madam Speaker, we, in fact, Mr. the member for Separia described it not as hell yard, but as hope yard to bring hope to the people. And Madam Speaker, it is so regrettable that yesterday we witnessed this catastrophe, this terror. Our citizens were brutalized. They were traumatized. And Madam Speaker, at Yesterday at Coover, Madam Speaker, when the Prime Minister was approached on this matter, the Prime Minister said, the, the reporter asked him, what about the, what's happening on the Beatum? He said, where are you standing? In Coover? Well, don't ask me what Beatum. I'm here to talk about Coover. Hmm. Hmm. The Prime Minister of the country. While persons were crying and making video, that was the response. Yeah, 24 hours later, we hear today, there was a National Security Council meeting this morning. And, well, finally, the, the, the culprits on the beat -em today, a few hours ago, they got a good, solid buffing from the Prime Minister. A good buffing. Because that's what they do. They buff up. So the persons down there may not engage in any activity again because they got a good buff up. But not one new initiative. Not one new plan. Not one new policy. Not one new program to engage with those communities. If you do not engage with those communities through employment, through training, through other mechanisms, sports, culture, the HDC was sponsoring when I was there a, a steel ban. I think it was, it was Harmonites in, the, in Mova. In, somewhere in Mova, Madam Speaker, we, we did that to engage, to engage the community and give support to culture. Culture, sports are very important along with employment to empower persons. And that, what happened yesterday means that that community is alienated as well. Not that it is wrong. I'm not, I'm not condoning that. But you have, you have alienated the community. The community is demobilized. So if someone is arrested and they believe is wrong and so on, they pelt stone at cars, pelt at a, a, a trolley from a supermarket at the cars and so on yesterday. And the response of the prime minister is to boof them up today. That's the response. You see, Madam Speaker, we'll get nowhere with that approach. You will soon discover that buffing up people is not public policy. Programs, articulated programs, that is the way to go. And if today the Prime Minister could have said anything about a new initiative, would have brought hope. But Madam Speaker, they brought no hope to that situation at all. Madam Speaker, what did they do in the two years that they have been there? When they entered office, there were several areas, Trash Trail, um, Bonner, uh, several areas yet to be developed, contracts to execute and work. Immediately they got in, Madam Speaker, a fascinating thing happened, Madam Speaker, upon entry, as soon as they got in there. Madam Speaker, would you believe that by, they got in there, and by 17th of December 2015, we, that's a few weeks away after the election, by 17th of December 2016, the Board of Directors of the 
HDC, they suspended and subsequently fired the engine room of the HDC. They fired eight managers, gone, the people who were working to deliver. The Off Commission of Inquiry, among one of its findings, we must recall, spoke about the, the, the collapse of the public service as far as infrastructure development because of a failure to employ qualified people, because of a failure to recruit and strengthen people to build institutions. Eight senior managers at HDC went on the 17th of, of December. But Madam Speaker, what is fascinating about that is that on the 17th of December, according to the board minute, which is in my hand, Madam Speaker, a decision was taken to recruit, to hire a consultancy team or auditing firm to conduct an audit on the HDC. Absolutely nothing is wrong with that. The HDC section 19 of the HDC Act allows the corporation to hire an uh, auditor and so on. Section 19.3, nothing is wrong. But Madam Speaker, this was done, indicated that they are going to hire on the 17th of December. Madam Speaker, you know what happened? There was no open tendering or bidding, no open tendering or bidding for any auditing firm. Bam, on the same day as the 17th of December, before a decision was taken at the board, Price Waterhouse Coopers went into the HDC and committed a criminal offense. They took government property. They went into the HDC on the 17th of December, took government property when they were not authorized by a decision of the board. But you see, Madam Speaker, what is happening in this country is boards are not running companies here. Boards are not running company. Ministers are running company. That is the important thing. Ministers are running company. On the 17th of December, the, the, the managers who were to be suspended and fired had their servers and computers because they like taking computer and server and phone. I think they have a preoccupation with email and texting and so on. So we'll get to that as well because I also have some text and email. Because I like that too. So Madam Speaker, they went in, PricewaterhouseCoopers went into the HDC illegally, took government property without a board of director decision on a state corporation under an act of parliament. They were given information. They took it. They go on their way to conduct investigation. When somebody tell the directors of the board at the HDC, look, you can't do that. You can't do that because we have to take a decision of the board. You know what, Adam Speaker, what happened? They then convene a meeting on the 7th of January, 2016. And on the 7th of January, 2016, a decision to engage PricewaterhouseCoopers was taken. 7th of January, when they illegally took government property on the 17th and day after of January. And they were paid, Madam Speaker, 138,250 United States dollars. Now, I am asking, are we paying a company in Trinidad that operates in Trinidad in US dollars? So the ordinary businessman cannot get $20. A traveling, um, a somebody going on vacation cannot get $200. But 138,000 United States dollars goes to Price Waterhouse Coopers, who illegally entered a government area and took. Madam Speaker, they will tell us, why are they quoting in US dollars? Why are they quoting if it is they're being paid in TT dollars? For audits in Trinidad. For audits in Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker, but the story continues in a fascinating way. It continues, Madam Speaker. So no formal decision taken. Price Waterhouse Coopers go to work. And Madam Speaker, at this time, nothing is happening. There's no policy implementation. There's no distribution of homes. There's nothing happening in the sector, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, we have come across some quite fascinating pieces of information. And Madam Speaker, it, it really is mind-boggling that when Price Waterhouse Coopers comes in to do what is called an independent, neutral, audit, which they, which they can do with the authority of the board of directors, the minister-in-law gives specific or general directions in writing. I just want to underline that. Huh? Minister gives specific or general directions in writing to the board of directors. And while that is happening, Madam Speaker, 17th of December, computer gone. Uh, information gone, Madam Speaker. When we... <laughs> 
When we look at this now, they fire people, of course. They receive a letter from the former managing director indicating that what they are doing is illegal, Madam Speaker, illegal. The letter goes to Price Waterhouse Coopers in Victoria Avenue, Port of Spain, from the former managing director, Jolene John. A long letter indicating that they, it is illegal. Price Waterhouse Coopers, instead of responding to then a private citizen who is suspended and writing, pointing out a breach of the law, they send back this information to the HDC and say, look, the former, the managing director suspended, send this to us. Tell us what to do. Tell us what to do. That is the level at which we reach. And Madam Speaker, we have here the information. The lawyers at that time representing the HDC reply quickly. See attached copy of MD to PWC. Kindly advise what is happening. But Madam Speaker, the one that I want to get through quickly. And at this time, PricewaterhouseCoopers, who illegally started to conduct an audit, start asking for information. They want information on Tresh Trail, Indian Trail, Oasis Green, Cypress Hills, Eden Gardens, Retrench, Golconda, Gomez Trail, Maruga. Madam Speaker, by the 22nd of February, and I have to take a drink before I do this one. Yeah. In fact, I'm going to leave a bottle open. I'll need more. Madam Speaker, the 22nd of February, and this is the policy implementation. This is how institutions are destroyed and policy cannot be implemented. KOFI, Kofi.boxil, B O X I L L, at TTPWC.com, 22nd February 2016, writes a letter to one S. T U A R T R Y O U N G at gmail.com and also writes Madam Speaker, also writes Madam Speaker uh, a letter to another person. I just want to properly have the person um, here. N E W M A N G E O R G E 1955 at gmail.com. Madam Speaker, we believe that this is the Chairman of the Housing Development Corporation. Madam Speaker, I don't know what 1995 is, if it is a birthday um, or a wedding anniversary. I suspect not, but I think it's probably a birthday of some sort. So PwC is writing to the minister and the chairman, copied to the managing director, saying, Dear Minister and Chairman, this is dated 27, 22nd February. Dear Minister and Chairman, we are progressing with the audit and require your feedback regarding the electronic data, email review element of our work, and the initial budget estimates for our engagement. This is a body under the law. There is a law and act of parliament that govern them. Madam Speaker, the minister in reference to this, unless they change him, is the minister from San Fernando East. Well, it's not him, actually. It was the member for Port of Spain South at that time, I believe. The Minister for San Fernando East wasn't on the compound then. It was Port of Spain South, who was removed around March 17th, a few weeks later, removed. Her, her first removal was March 17th, around there. So PwC is writing the HDC and asking, and writing, not the HDC, actually, writing a Minister of Government completely outside of the HDC and asking for guidance regarding electronic data, email review, element of work, our estimated budget, and so on. That, that speaks to several infringes of the law. Yeah. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, I want to put it to you, Madam Speaker, that a forensic audit conducted in this way, or review, this company, this was the same company that made a mess out of the Oscar award. You all remember that? Yeah. Fined in the United Kingdom about six million United States dollars for misconduct. This company has certain obligations, Madam Speaker. They, they, if they are involved in audits or reviews, they cannot be reporting to a minister of government in the conduct of those audits. You cannot. You cannot even be engaging with ministers of government. They are politicians. Not an email gate again. Madam Speaker, why would the, the Kofi Boxel man write the minister and the chairman? 
Well, the chairman could get away. He could say, well, I am the chairman of the board. You know what is amazing? They came in on the 17th of December, PwC. No decision is taken by the board, but the board meet on the 6th of January, 2016, to quote unquote, ratify a decision. Yeah. The chairman of the Housing Development Corporation is not the prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago. You cannot take a decision and ratify it. What you do is if you have an emergency, you wrong robin your board of directors, you call an emergency board meeting, you wrong robin your board of directors. But the chairman apparently took this decision by himself and decided, look, we decide that. Next few weeks we ratify. Madam Speaker, this speaks of collusion. They want to talk about collusion. This speaks about collusion. Madam Speaker, in another entity, they want to sue everybody. They, they have brought party action. That's PNM action they brought. <coughs> PNM action. I hope the next government will be diligent and continue that work. Me, for what? Again? Yeah. Madam Speaker, I want to look, go to the 22nd again. One Stuart Young writing to Brent Lyons, imagine a minister, a minister in the ministry of the Attorney General writing to Brent Lyons. It is not even copied to the Minister of Housing. Let me begin there. It's not even copied to Port of Spain South at that time. And he replied, this is your call on the same matter of update on the decision. He replies on the same day, actually. This is your call. On the face of it, I am in agreement with Brent. Regards, Stuart. I mean, who is Brent? You grew up with Brent? Brent is your friend? I imagine as the managing director of the HEC. But in the... And another thing they're talking about, I have an inappropriately close relationship with a the CEO. They put my birth paper, they put my date of birth on a court document. You know, it had a birthday party for me, officials of the ministry. CEO come, the next day he said, well, thanks for the invitation. They put that in a court document, you know, my birthday. <laughs> so next birthday now, I have to tell people, send me wishes, but don't come. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I never call you fella Gary or Gars. Now, this one might be a Gar, but... I never call him Gary or Gars. Who is Brent? What is that familiarity? What is that closeness, that chumminess that Stuart is writing to Brent, but not to Marlene? You know, this is the involvement of the minister that got him into trouble at PTSC, which is before the police. That is before the police. I say nothing more on PTSC. It is the same company in EFCL now we are hearing conducted seven audits, I think, in three months, and there are questions about that audit, Madam Speaker. The, the other one I will just drop on this and leave it, is that PwC is guilty of misconduct, and I call for full investigation into all their audits under this administration. PwC is asking now in a letter dated December 17th, PwC, Madam Speaker, in, in a letter, no, it's not the 17th, it's Around the same time of March, Madam Speaker, I have it here. Do you know PwC is writing, Madam Speaker, they are writing the TTMF and asking for personal information on persons who have received housing, their payments detail? Hmm. PricewaterhouseCoopers wrote to the TTMF. They have a privacy, a confidentiality clause in all agreements. The police, by a court order of some kind, can get information if they wish. PwC writes to the TTMF and tells them, we are conducting an investigation into um, the HDC and everything that went on there. And we are trying to get some information and so on. Could you please um, tell us and give us information on the applications and the what's called payment schedules? For Loretta, um, Lauren Legal, Renata Jones, Nicole Carter, Indira McFarlane Lee, Anne Mahabia, Rory Moses. Madam Speaker, a letter dated 21st April 2016. How can PwC, a private company, ask a government company to give us private information on payments? This is after household process complete. They paying. Madam Speaker, I want to alert you that this matter is on its way to the Integrity Commission and the police and Price Waterhouse Coopers, as they had to explain in South Africa, in India, in London, in the United States, they will have to explain under government of Trinidad and Tobago, if not your government, certainly this government. They will have to explain themselves. 
You see, Madam Speaker, they, they went and fired people and then discovered that they don't have grounds to fire people. In a remarkable letter, Madam Speaker, a letter from a legal firm hired. The, the legal firm writes the HDC and tells them, they say, we are, we are preparing a defense in the matter involving Ms. John and others. Um, if you have any information, let us know. We want to get more information to build a defense. Fire people in December, suspend them. And in May, ask them, do you have anything? Did the audit find anything? Do you have anything you could give us? We're trying to build a defense. This is how they operate. Madam Speaker, if this was not bad enough, I know my time here is now limited. And I have a few minutes. Again. I want to get to the allocation policy of the housing sector. Because you see, Madam Speaker, once you collapse the sector and you do any old thing you want, Madam Speaker, including distributing homes willy-nilly, and you can't defend it because you can distribute and defend, Madam Speaker, the Minister of Housing, and I have a whole list here with the Minister of Housing signing off on recommendations and so on. I don't have time to go through that. The member for San Fernando East, I have a, a 300 recommendations from the minister. The minister will not know 275 of those people, but he has to sign and recommend them. Because they're not from San Fernando East, he will have a few people. We have here the bulk of recommendations for Maruga Tableland, San Fernando East, San Fernando West, as a few constituencies. Recommended by ministers, many recommended by San Fernando West, that's his job. He won't know the people. Ministers pass things to him, he passed the HDC. They want to make a big fuss over one application of yeah. one person. Yeah. They say they got housing because the minister colluding and so on. You know what is collusion, Madam Speaker? Madam Speaker, yeah, when I asked the question earlier this year as to the housing allocation policy as it relates to Victoria Keys, we were told that advertisements went out, people applied, and it was market taking, market forces taking root. People applied, they pay their money. Madam Speaker, we got an answer to the question eventually. And in this answer, served in the parliament, we were taken aback by, in, at the first instance by two military leaders who were able to afford, afford multi-million dollar apartments and so on. Four million dollars. We were taken back by that, Madam Speaker. But nowhere in the answer to this question did the minister then tell us, Madam Speaker, that they were distributing Victoria Key's apartments to, valued 1.8 million to persons on a rent-to-own basis. Because rent-to-own is an HDC policy. It is there when a client cannot satisfy the full amount of money and the difference is $150,000 more or less you initiate what's called a rent to own. The minister didn't tell us in his reply that rent to own, people got rent to own arrangements. He didn't tell us that. We learned that months after. And Madam Speaker, the rent to own list is an interesting list. It includes an employee of the Prime Minister's office. It includes a communication manager at the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development. Madam Speaker, it includes a former board member of the, no, a board member now, of the Petra Trin. Those are on the rent to own list. I want to ask the minister if he um, presented keys to them. Because they want to accuse me of what? I didn't present key to somebody. Did you present keys to your communications manager? I have no difficulty with people getting housing units. That's what they're, they're there for. People paying, that's fine. I have no difficulty. Our difficulty is always process. On what basis did you select these people on a HDC policy of rent to own, when these apartments are to the tune of $1.8 million. I will not call the names of these people. I will not. I will not. But you see, Madam Speaker, there's one troubling matter that faced me in that. One troubling matter. Madam Speaker, when we got the answer to this question, what troubled me is that many of these names here are known to us in the national community. Some people are business people, some people are retired public so servants. Um, and you know, some people really, I could, I could imagine they have the means to pay $2.4 million and so on. So we didn't have a problem. I mean, former permanent secretaries are here and so on, and I imagine they can attract that kind of money given their gratuity or whatever. But you see, Madam Speaker, we saw a name of a person who was able to access a 
million dollars penthouse loft. I think that is how it's called. And Madam Speaker, that person was able to attract um, that. And that is a lot of money, Madam Speaker. And when we, we did some check-in, Madam Speaker, and Madam Speaker, that person who attracted this 4.5 million penthouse loft applied 24 February 2017, mortgage loan, full sale, full sale. You get a loan and you buy it. But Madam Speaker, a name was called, and I asked the member for San Fernando East, I asked him politely, do you have knowledge of that applicant? One Sean Sherising. Do you have knowledge of that applicant? You see, that person, and somebody gave me some information, paying $4.5 million for an apartment, that person is known to the police. That person is known to the police and has been in the police database as, in some cases, a victim, in some cases, reporting threats, and has been a victim of a lot of things. In fact, that person is a very unfortunate person. He has been a victim of robbery, victim of dishonor check, victim of dishonor check, victim of dishonor check, victim of robbery, road traffic accident, victim of housebreaking and larceny, victim of reports of threats. I wonder if this person is a victim of money laundering. Madam Speaker, I just asked the minister to conduct an investigation and be open with this matter to tell us how some, somebody who is so unlucky and unfortunate to be a victim all over town can get a mortgage for $4.5 million to purchase, to purchase a home and whether or not the member for San Fernando East has a knowledge of this person. And if the member could tell us that knowledge, we will be very happy. Because we are prepared to tell him. We are prepared to tell him the knowledge of that person. And Madam Speaker, this issue speaks to money laundering. And their policy decision now, this HDC today cannot pay. How much money? This HDC cannot pay contractors. A contractor won a matter yesterday or day before in the court, where the court ruled that a contractor must be paid in full. Contractor cannot be paid in full, went to court and win. But Price Waterhouse Coopers could be paid in full. Agostini could be paid in full. But the contractors cannot be paid. The large scale contractors that they want to make link with. Do you know every one of the large scale contractors in the HDC today was recruited by the People's National Movement? Not one large scale contractor came under the partnership. All one knew. All came under the PNM. And Madam Speaker, the large scale contractors are owed millions of dollars. They are taking them to court. And when they take them to court, the government response is, response is a counter sue. It's a counter sue and claim that null and void because you're thief and you hide and you collude and you cartel. You cartel or you cartel, <laughs> Madam Speaker. That is their response. Today, no recognized mega contractor want to build house. But they are giving away money. They are giving away money to people who want to build house as part of their build it yourself policy. That's where they reach in this country. Their policy for housing is go build it yourself. So a worker in KFC by the cashier need housing. You tell the worker, go build it yourself. Take time off from your job and build it. You, uh, a employee in the ministry want housing. You tell the employee, go build it yourself. That is the approach. And when they are doing that, Madam Speaker, a fascinating letter appeared in the press, which I had to take a copy of. It was written by one Noel. Madam Speaker, it was written by one S. Noel from Sandy Grande, 6 November 2017, in which this person is saying that it could well be that only oligarchs and money launderers can afford to tender for projects. An additional benefit to money launderers is that they get clean money at the end when they start off with dirty money. Because all the contractors are being owed money and not being paid, and they're not building house. So it's new contractors have to come in, the new contractors now hear this, they have to come in with their own money. Where are they getting money from? The PPP in Mount Hope, wherever, under NH International, I don't know the status of that, but the difficulty there was the contractor wanted some guarantee. Madam Speaker, which contractor in this country will put their life savings in the hands of this government to build house and be paid? Which contractor? So what you do, they are suggesting here, is you use the housing sector to launder money. Mm. 
You take money that you get, build house, and get it back from when people pay their money for a house plus 100,000 or 50,000. Madam Speaker, if the government doesn't review that policy and do not meet and treat with contractors who are building homes and in some cases finishing homes, the HDC and the housing sector will become a nest for money laundering. If they do not deal with that problem, Madam Speaker, they will not be able to, con to construct as of this time and this date. I am not sure, subject to correction, but not one single home has finished under this administration. Not one. But they're entitled to that because they, are, they may be busy fixing and distributing other homes. Madam Speaker, in the few minutes left, I want to warn this government that what happened in the Beatum yesterday, Madam Speaker, what happened in the Beatum was not an accident. That is an impulse from the ground. That is a response to poor governance. It is a response it is a response to their failure, and it will reoccur unless they change their ways. Thank you, Madam time. Speaker, for your attention. Member for San Fernando East. Madam Speaker, I thank you for recognizing me, as I believe it very important as Minister of Housing Number four, Puchis. I'll just allow you to say, I beg to move. Oh, sorry. I beg to move, ma'am. Yeah. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I'd like to second this motion and I defer my right to speak at a later time. Member for San Fernando East. Madam Speaker, I thank you for the opportunity to contribute to this motion. Madam Speaker, a motion. Be it resolved that the House take note of the continuing failure of government to implement a viable housing policy to provide affordable housing units to qualified and deserving citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. But Madam Speaker, I've listened quite intently to the member for Orokuch East, and I think the motion may have been poorly constructed. The motion ought to have read be it resolved that this House take note of the continuing failure of government to implement an auditing policy, if that is what he has come here uh. to talk uh, Madam Speaker, I take great objection. And let me just deal with a few things that the, the Minister of the Member for Orokuch East, former Minister, former minister of Housing. <laughs> and let me just say as well, Madam Speaker, I was very surprised that the, minister, the former Minister of Housing, Member for Orokuch East, would have, bring such, would have brought such a motion having regard to his abysmal failure as he called it. Oh. And Madam Speaker, I will go on to talk about his failings as Minister of Housing. Oh, Madam Speaker, instead of talking about the housing policy, low and middle income citizens, qualifying citizens, who are in need of housing, his entire contribution was fixed on the selection and the process of an auditing firm. And Madam Speaker, all the members' protestations, I would submit, should not be brought into Parliament. He should reserve them to, for explanation in the courts of Trinidad. Oh, yes, sir, yes. That's right. Member for, the, the, the member for Orokuch East speaks about the tendering process, about a tendering process. Tendering process for the HDC. How did they come to select this auditing firm? Madam Speaker, a couple of weeks ago, a matter was raised in the public domain, and it dealt with state accommodation provided for members of government as well as uh, employees of the state visiting from time to time. And what I would have discovered, Madam Speaker, was in 2015, the member for Oropooch East, while the Minister of Housing would have been in charge with a government department called PRESDI. PRESDI would have had responsibility for Federation Villas, where state accommodation is provided, Madam Speaker. And I want to ask the member for Oropooch East, 
what tendering process was carried out when government, the then government, under the member for Saparia, invited a US IT auditing firm and provided them state accommodation to treat with their defense to the email gate matter. The member, didn't, the member didn't disclose that. And Madam Speaker, let me get to the Victoria Keys because I take great umbrage to anybody interfering in any way with my reputation. Madam Speaker, from the day we launched Victoria Keys and has been reported in many newspapers, we have always said and maintained that the disposal of the units at Victoria Keys would be on the open market, via renter own, mm -hmm. and a number of units retained for government. We have gone about, we have developed a brand, we have marketed the development called Victoria Keys. And I'll talk about Victoria Keys a little later on. At no time, Madam Speaker, did the process of the sale of those units ever involve the minister <coughs> Madam Speaker. So he is calling somebody's name in the parliament and accusing that person of money laundering. Well, they will deal with him at the appropriate time. Mm. But Madam Speaker, I'm pleased. I'm pleased. he stood up here and he said, the member for, for Orokuch East, he stood up here and he said that the, 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 the purchaser purchased the unit subject to a mortgage. Where you purchase units subject to a mortgage at any bank, that purchase is subject to the FIU regulations. Mm -hmm. Madam Speaker, let me say it here. One of the matters I insisted on, and I instructed the HTC, was to write to the FIU to ensure, to ensure, Madam Speaker, and we wrote, we wrote several times, to ensure that all these matters, the sale, the open market sale of the HDC was subject to the FIU regulations because in the sphere of things, the HDC would have moved away from the usual allocation and distribution of units to sale on the open market. And I made sure, Madam Speaker, to get the HDC to do that. Madam Speaker, let me touch on something else. The, Madam Speaker, the member for who Jesus is disturbing me. But Madam Speaker, he also, he also mentioned matters in East Port of Spain about putting in programs and during Christmas putting in programs and, and involving the community members and so on. I want to, Madam Speaker, I wasn't in government then, wasn't a member of parliament, but I keenly remember, Madam Speaker, a member for Oropooch East being photographed in the national newspaper with one of the members who was picked up in the beat -um yesterday, yeah. Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, the member for Oropooch East and the then managing director of the HDC, the new, Madam Speaker, I need your protection. Uh, member for San Fernando East, please continue. Member for Carney East, please remember. Member for Carney East, please remember standing order 53. Continue. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The then managing director, soon to be deputy political leader of the HDC, of the, of the, sorry, of the UNC, of the UNC, deputy political leader. Madam Speaker, when I saw it that the, the former, former managing director of the HDC was now promoted as the, as the new deputy political leader, I thought that the member for Saparia clearly thought that the member for Orokuch East needed help. Yeah. 
And I wondered to myself, Madam Speaker, what, what date would that new deputy leader of the UNC be invited into the Senate? And which one of them will they now boot out to make way for who? But Madam Speaker, I digress. I digress, Madam Speaker. So Madam Speaker, the former managing director, as well as the member for Orokuch East, was congratulating Spanish as being one of the best contractors in East Port of Spain. Congratulating them, and Madam Speaker, we now have information that under the member for Oropuchis, when he was then Minister of Housing, would have paid the coward tax under the guise of giving them votes. Please continue. Madam Speaker, to keep a false sense of peace in the, in the East Port of Spain area. And what we are seeing now, Madam Speaker. 48 6, Madam Speaker. 48 is repeating it again. Please continue, Member for San Fernando. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker. So all these color me orange and all these things. Hoop of life. Color, color me yellow. Life sport. Life sport, <coughs> Madam Speaker. Life sport, Madam Speaker. Criminal genocide. What tendency? Payment to the criminal element in this country, Madam Speaker. And we must now, we are now reaping the rewards for that. And we have to now deal with that. And the member for point 14 has to deal with that, Madam Speaker. But Madam Speaker, let me move on. So Madam Speaker, as I said, when I saw the motion, I thought there was a significant weakness in the motion, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, every time the member of Oropuch East speaks, and he speaks about a housing policy, he always presupposes that the entirety of the government's housing policy has to deal with the construction or the building of housing units. And I'm surprised by that, Madam Speaker, because growing up in school, in the school days, Madam Speaker, I always knew that the UNC's housing policy, charted by Sir John Humphrey, was always for the distribution of land so that the beneficiaries can con con construct their own homes, houses. But that was the Pande government. In comes the government led by the member for Separia. And all it did was carbon copy the PNM's 2002 policy. Of course it was a good policy. It was a PNM policy. But you completely misunderstood the policy because the policy is not only about the construction of housing units, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the 2002 policy, and I've said it time and time again, it is built on three pillars. It's built on affordability, accessibility, and the improvement of life for citizens. Not corruption. Not corruption. And Madam Speaker, for middle and low income earners, remember for Orapuch East started very early on trying to defend the construction of units, as he says, to middle income earners. And we'll get to that, Madam Speaker, because it all turns on what is the de definition of a middle income earner. But Madam Speaker, the housing policy is more than just the construction of housing units. That is called the Accelerated Housing Program. That is just one. And perhaps the member's misunderstanding was a reason why he was such an abysmal failure. Mm -hmm. Madam Speaker, the policy also takes into consideration the rental program for the very lowest earners. Madam Speaker, no matter what time, what year you examine the HDC's database, you would find that the bulk of persons, the bulk of applicants applying for housing units are at the low end of the spectrum. So we have the rental, the rental program. Madam Speaker, there is also the rental own program that makes the availability of housing units more affordable for those who can't readily afford. 
There's also squatter regularization, Madam Speaker. The residential lots program. And the residential lots program is very important because the member for Oropooch East will have to answer in another place about a particular residential lots program mm -hmm. for ex carony workers. Mm -hmm. And I'll get to that in a moment, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, we also have the affordable mortgage programs. But Madam Speaker, I understand why the member for Oropooch East is so fixated on this housing construction programs because he has become accustomed to the largest. The largest sit down number. What you tell me, sit down. I start. You have to sit Order, 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 member for Carney East, please. Member for Carney East, I'm on my legs. Member for Oropooch East. I want to assure every member here, they will have an opportunity to make a contribution to the debate, if they so wish, in accordance with the standing orders. If there's an interjection, members know the relevant standing order and the practice and the procedure. Member for San Fernando East, please continue. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, let me just clarify. When I said largest, Madam Speaker, under the People's Partnership Administration, under the member for Sapari, under the member, under, um, as Minister of Planning, the member for Carney Central, the, mini, the, the member for Oropooch East as Minister of Housing controlled over half of the development program. And I wonder if members opposite know that. He controlled over half of the development program. It was the CPEP, it was LSA, it was EMBD, HDC, Judicot. Yes, Sugar Welfare as well, e Madam Speaker. E e EMBD. Yes, Madam. So, so, and Madam Speaker, he. But Madam Speaker, we're talking about HDC. We're talking HDC, Madam Speaker. And in the five years, Madam Speaker, in the HDC alone, the member had eight billion dollars to spend in the HDC alone. Over 60 months, he had $8 billion to spend on affordable housing. Madam Speaker, that equates to about $133 million available to the member for Oropooch East per month. But, Madam Speaker, this motion is about affordable housing, so let us go into how, how we contributed to affordable housing. Madam Speaker, there were about seven housing projects started by the People's Partnership. When they came in, as he said, it's a, a rolling program, the accelerated housing program. They would have met many more from the Manning administration. So they continued the accelerated housing program for citizens. All governments, we expect them to do that, Madam Speaker. But Madam Speaker, there are two housing projects that concerned me and ought to concern the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Two housing projects. One housing project, Madam Speaker, Cypress Gardens in Union Hall. It would have automatically raised red flags, Madam Speaker, because that housing development was given to a contractor to construct a housing development for the cost of $1.6 billion. One contractor, probably about a thousand, a thousand units, a thousand units. And Oasis, Madam Speaker, the other one, probably about a thousand as well. A thousand units at one point three billion dollars. Madam Speaker, this is unprecedented in the history of housing construction that one contractor would get close to. $1.6 billion to construct a housing development program, and in the other case, $1.3 billion. Super mega contracts. But Madam Speaker, the issues 
the issues revolve, of course, the cost. So at 1,000 units, remember for Karen, he's is a quick mathematician, so you could probably figure out how much, how many, right? One would cost, yeah. Manosika, let me, let me tell you the contract details for that. Original contract sum, $1.49 billion. Approved variation sum, $150 million for a total of $1.6 billion. Madam Speaker, what this translates into when you take it by a cost per unit, this is just the construction I'm going to deal with now of the housing units. For a single family, two bedroom, one, two bedroom, one bath, one housing unit cost six hundred and thirty-seven thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. Madam Speaker, when the PNM, oh under the Honourable Prime Minister, when we were building housing units all over Trinidad and Tobago, a single family, similar unit, never cost more than two hundred and fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Madam Speaker, a duplex. A duplex, Madam Speaker. Three bedroom, two bath. Cypress Gardens. Building construction cost. Nine hundred and fifty five thousand dollars, Madam Speaker. Under the PNM. Those units would have been constructed at a rate of two hundred and eighty-five thousand dollars. Wow. How much come here? Madam Speaker, an apartment, an apartment reserved for the the, the lower income owners, Madam Speaker, an apartment under the member for Orapuj East will construct an apartment units. Three bedroom, two bath for $1.4 million per unit. $1.4 million. Oasis, similar matter, Madam Speaker. Original contract sum, $1.2 billion. Approved variation sum, $93 million for a total of $1.3 billion. Madam Speaker, a townhouse, three bedroom, two bath, $850,000. An apartment, three bedroom, two bath, $1.1 million, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, this, Madam Speaker, this takes me into another realm. This takes me into another realm because during, in 2014, I believe it was, they raised the income ceiling. They raised it to $45,000. And what that would have done, the effect of that, they would have crowded out the poorer in society, right. the ones who need it most. And Madam Speaker, that is why I can say to citizens now, when you drive in Oasis Gardens, or when you drive in Cyprus, and you see the Range Rovers parked up, you see the Jaguars parked up, you see the BMWs parked up, Madam Speaker, you shouldn't be surprised. Because the member for Oropuch East raised the income the income ceiling to allow for the wealthy in society to buy those units, Madam Speaker. And the wealthy in society, the wealthy in society would purchase those units. You know why, Madam Speaker? Because the average subsidy on those units about 40 to 50 percent. It means, therefore, Madam Speaker, that someone so lucky to benefit from one of these units would immediately become half a million dollars richer. Mm. And I want to ask the member for Oropuch East, what process was done to allocate those units? Mm. But Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, that's not, that's not the, only, the only red flag, you know. That's not the only issue with these contracts, you know. Madam Speaker, this contract, $1.6 billion for Cyprus and $1.3 billion for Oasis Gardens were done on a sole selective basis. Oh my God. When I dug in, Madam Speaker, into the board minutes of the HDC, you know how, Madam Speaker, let me explain to you how this was done. Somebody from the HDC, 
called a contractor, T.N. Ramnat, sending a request for proposal. Same person called another contractor, Ramhit, sending a proposal. And they accepted the proposal without competitive tender, without any, with, on a sole selective basis. Madam Speaker, under the PNM, we could never do that. Madam Speaker, under the PNM, we could never do that. And I wonder if the Contractors Association know about that. I wonder if the JCC knows about that. Madam Speaker, under the PNM, we would have at least split up that contract into 16 parts and give it to spread it around, spread the wealth. Spread it around, Madam Speaker. He talks about redistribution of wealth. He started off speaking about that. Well, now we know what the redistribution of wealth really meant. And Madam Speaker, you would expect that at these high prices, you would get high quality. Madam Speaker, that was not the case. Madam Speaker, I have persons sending me, I don't know how they got my phone number. They send me on, on social media, Madam Speaker, pictures and videos of the poor state of these housing units and the amount of money that the HEC now has to pay to repair these units. At $955,000 per Subsidized. unit, Madam Speaker. Subsidized. Subsidized. There's, there's a spring in the middle. Some of the units were built over pipelines, Madam Speaker. The persons can't get the deeds to their houses now. i leave that for now, Madam Speaker. Victoria Keys. Much has been said about Victoria Keys. There's a lot of strong objection. A lot of strong objection. Now the latest one is that there is money laundering. First, they took objection to Tobago MPs being provided state accommodation, Madam Speaker. Why are there members of parliament? Why there are members of parliament, right? That is the latest objection, Madam Speaker. And the media is questioning it, as the media ought to. But one thing that nobody has ever questioned, the member for Oropooch East, as well as the former managing director, Madam Speaker, or the chairman of the board, Mr. Moonan, who is a friend of the member for Oropooch East, never, never questioned was, how did a project what was, that was supposed to cost Around $200 million meant for low and min middle income persons in the Dego Martin area, Dego Martin Central, Dego Martin Northeast, Port of Spain South, persons interested in living in, in that area. How did that project move from $200 million to $652 million? <laughs> no one has ever asked him, but I will ask him now. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'll get an answer. But Madam Speaker, I would ask the member for Oropuchis, who authorized the escalation and the change in scope at the Victoria Keys development from 200 million to 652 million? Madam Speaker, no, sit. Madam Speaker, I'll also ask, Madam Speaker, who approved the inclusion of central air conditioning? Who approved multi-story car parks with elevators in them? Madam Speaker, they are housing developments, multi-story units all over the country without elevators. Madam Speaker, a parking lot with three levels, they put an elevator in it. Who authorized that? Who authorized the inclusion of a pool, a clubhouse, and a tennis court? Madam Speaker. So he will answer he will answer when he gets his chance. So Madam Speaker, let me ask one more question. Had they been so efficient, because they were not, to complete the Victoria Keys development, and those units having cost what they cost now, which is around three million dollars an apartment. What was their plan for the disposal of those units? What was their plan for the disposal of those units? And Madam Speaker, this government, Madam Speaker, we decided to offer those on the 
open market to recover as much money, Madam Speaker, because of the inflation in cost. We offered it on the open market so that we can get as much sale as possible, as much of the proceeds to continue our housing construction program that they left abandoned. And Madam Speaker, we had to establish, as I said, a marketing plan. We had to establish brand Victoria Keys, and we worked very hard on it because we really needed to get those things sold. And at every chance the member for Oropooch East gets, he gets up and he just throws dirt on the whole development. Throws dirt on it. Because he doesn't want us to get the sale of those units, recover it on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago to continue the housing construction program for low and middle income earners. Victoria Keys. And Madam Speaker, let me just move on. Ignoring Karen East. As the world does. Madam Speaker, I want to bring to your attention, Madam Speaker, I want to bring to your attention the type of decisions that can be made, the type of decisions that can be made at the government level that would disadvantage the taxpayers of Trinidad and Tobago and those applicants seeking affordable housing. And I want you to imagine this, Madam Speaker. Just imagine it for a while. The year is 2004. 50 acre parcel. Madam Speaker, there was an agreement between seller and purchaser to purchase 50 acre parcel for $17 million. Fast forward to 2010, agreement still subsists. The 2004 agreement was rescinded and a new agreement for sale and purchase was registered. So we assume that the land was bought. Registered. It's now spent to attack the 15 more minutes. If you so indict me, you may proceed. Yes, Madam Speaker. I'll hurry along. Registered at the Board of Inland Revenue, a sale price of $5 million. For the same, land, for the same, land. same land, same parties. Yes, Madam Speaker, and stamp duty paid on the $5 million at $350,000. In 2010, on the same day, Madam Speaker, at the same Board of Inland Revenue, same, same property, same parties, same lawyer. Madam Speaker, a mortgage was registered in favor of the seller, of the purchasers, for $18.5 million. Same day, same day, sale agreement, $5 million stamp duty paid on that. Same day, the same land, the same parties, they registered a mortgage, $18.5 million. Madam Speaker, that is, in my view, stamp duty fraud. It's a back door. It's a back door. Madam Speaker, between 2010 to 2012, the land was developed by a developer for $29 million. In 2012, the land, same land, was offered for sale to a state agency for $200 million. Oh, and the same land, Madam Speaker, was state a state agency for $200 million. And the same land was valued by a reputable valuer at $56 million. Wow. Mm. In 2012, Madam Speaker, the, eight, the, 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 the state agency, Madam Speaker, purchased the land Notwithstanding the reputable valuation at $56 million, they purchased the land for $175 million. Oh. Relying on some other valuation. Commissioner valuations. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, I have a question. Any right thinking, moral, upstanding, citizen of Trinidad and Tobago, so hearing the these set of circumstances, whether they wouldn't think that something here was unlawful and immoral. Madam Speaker, this is not a fiction. Madam Speaker, this is a real story. And let me tell you who the actors are. 
The lawyer in the story, Madam Speaker, is Rukchan Chedi Singh, nice. ex-chairman of the NGC. Nice. And former director of the SIS. That's right. Madam Speaker, the agency involved is the HDC. Ministry? The minister in charge at the time is a member for Oropooch East. The managing director is the soon-to-be deputy political leader of the UNC, Ms. Jolene John. And the, pr the, the prime minister, the member for Separia. And Madam Speaker, the developer in this was the SIS. Oh, I see. Serial offenders. Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker. Dream team. This land was purchased in central Trinidad, mm -hmm. in a place where the state owns 80% of all the land in central Trinidad, Madam Speaker. That is where. And Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, the story doesn't end here, you know. For one of the actors, Madam Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, for one of the actors, one of the actors in the matter met a brutal death. Yes, yeah, true. Like that. Mysterious. Death. But uh, mysterious, he was one of the actors. May we cast no aspersions, Madam Speaker. We cast no, Madam Speaker. No, no, no. That is the that that is the member for Orapuch East, and that is what he talks about. That is their policy for affordable housing. Yes. Madam Speaker, the EMBD. EMBD. It is a part of this, Madam Speaker, because the EMBD is responsible for developing residential lots for ex-carony workers to put up housing. The matter is a housing motion. And they talk about aff affordability, but Madam Speaker, let me examine the affordability of... Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm sorry. Let me, let's examine the affordability. <coughs> Record of affordability. There was one of the EMBD sites, Rupsing Road. Rupsing Road was developed partly under the PNM, partly under the UNC. Phase one at Rupsing Road, PNM developed at $109,000 per lot. What under what the <laughs> member for Oropooch East, under the member for Oropooch East, as a minister in Kearney East, yes, the constant, please, proceed. Yes, member for Kearney East, member for Kearney East. <laughs> members, I'm on my legs. All members, members. Proceed, Member San Fernando East. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I hope I get some injury time for that. <laughs> Madam Speaker, Rupsing Road. Mr. Deputy Speaker, Rupsing Road, phase one, 109,000 per <coughs> lot. PNM. Phase two, under the UNC, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Same road. They developed a lot for the whopping price of $879,000. Oh, oh, oh. $879,000 per lot. In exchange, Mr. Deputy Speaker, phase one, $109,000 per lot under the PNM. Phase 2A and B under the UNC, $310,000 per lot. Phase three under the UNC, $399,000 development cost per lot. But, Madam, but Mr. Deputy Speaker, the greatest is Pity Moon. Petty Moon, Petty Moon, Petty Moon, Petty Moon, which is a part of San Fernando East, Mr. Deputy Speaker, Phase 2 and Phase 2A, that development was most unfortunate to be developed by the UNC. Mr. Deputy Speaker, that was developed at an average cost of $1.17 million per lot. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, most of these sites, Silence. most of these sites, Mr. Deputy Speaker, have no approvals. 
They went through sh what I would call sham exercises and giving out leases, giving out leases, giving out leases. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the recipient of those leases cannot even build a house because there are no approvals. None. No approvals. Mr. Deputy Speaker, let me move on quickly to... I just want to touch on... Remember for Oropuch East, he spoke about um, how many houses he was able to give out and he also spoke about when he walks all over this country, people hold him and they congratulate him. I want to ask him, Mr. Deputy Speaker, as we are on that point, whether the persons are, were the recipients of the housing units or whether the persons were the contractors who he had, the, who he had text message relationships with. But that's that. Both. Mr. Deputy Speaker, a couple of sittings ago, the member from Oropuch East took great issue with the cost of $250,000 paid by this government to hold the spotlight event at the Hyatt. A very important event just to show the transparency of this government, to involve all sectors of society, to come in and understand what economic circumstances this country had faced. Mr. Deputy Speaker, let me report something here to you, and it may be shocking to you. 2012, Mr. Deputy Speaker, one key distribution ceremony on December the 3rd cost the HDC, and is by extension the state of Trinidad and Tobago, $683,000 to distribute keys. And it doesn't end there. In 2013, key distribution at Cypress Hills, $586,000. In 2015, Coover Exchange, $232,000. Key distribution in 2015, 2nd of April, $364,000. And the member for Oropuch East comes to the parliament to talk about affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Mr. Deputy Speaker, let me talk about squatter reg. We have accelerated our program, squatter regularization, even though, Mr. Deputy Speaker, this was at its very beginnings a UNC program. From 2010 to 2015, not one squatter had been regularized under the People's Partnership Administration, under the Ministry of Housing. Not one squatter. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we have accelerated the development of those lands. We have pursued all the approvals. And I'm happy to announce to the country that in terms of our statutory leases, we are now able to provide statutory leases to certificate of comfort holders at 25% the market value, and they have 30 years to pay for it. And it's not just a promise. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we've already started the statutory process of going into the newspapers, identifying all the lands, identifying all the certificate of comfort holders. Squatters can now can now, those squatters who are caught by the 1998 Act, those certificate of comfort holders, they can now benefit from the equity in their lands. They can now benefit from the wealth that comes with land ownership. And this is what the PNM will deliver in terms of the housing policy. Land for the landless, Mr. Deputy Speaker, an abysmal failure. They launched it in 2012. Not one lot was given out. Not one lot was given out. Mr. Deputy Speaker, but contracts were given out to develop the lots, but not one lot was given out to any beneficiary. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we scrapped that program. We introduced the aided self-help program. Persons are excited by it. Mr. Deputy Speaker, there are a lot of applicants so far. Applications are, applications are open until the middle of January. And in that program, we offer subsidized residential lots at 30% the market value, but it doesn't end there. Because it's not just a residential lot giveaway or distribution program. 
we work with those beneficiaries all the way down to the end where they can construct their housing units. We offer them technical assistance. We offer them assistance in terms of getting financing to construct their homes. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in conclusion, we have shifted our focus. We have shifted the paradigm because the housing policy, as strong as the PNM's housing policy is, it must respond to the changing economic circumstances that the country would face from time to time. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we are completing all those housing developments that they would have started. That they would have started. We are completing all. We have introduced the aided self-help program. We have introduced tax incentive that we have operationalized. We have introduced that. We are pursuing our squatter regularization program. We have broadened the base for TTMF, our affordable mortgage programs. And as announced in the budget by the Honorable Minister of Finance, we are introducing our housing construction incentive program. Because at the rate of 174 persons on the applica applicant database, we believe that the construction of these housing units can be driven by the demand for them in society. So we are introducing that. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I would say, yes. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I would say that under the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development, we are committed to the housing sector. We are committed to doing all that we can do to ensure that those who need it most, those low and middle income earners, those who need it most, can access it and improve their standard of living. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I, rec I recognize the member for Coover South. Thank you, Madam um, Mr. Deputy Speaker. As I take great pride in joining this debate, which has been piloted by my colleague, the member for Arapuch East, and who has placed a proper perspective on where we are in terms of the state of housing in Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Speaker and the member for San Fernando East, I am reminded that, you know, I had a partner we used to lie, and he liked to heckle people a lot. <laughs> and when he spoke, he liked to tell people that his, or tell them that the bark was louder than the bite. And uh, his presentation here this evening reminded me of uh, that person in terms of his back really being loaded than his bite. And there are a number of issues that I would want to put to the minister and the member for San Fernando East because uh, during his contribution, he had an adequate time, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to indicate to Trinidad and Tobago if he was familiar with a person who had received an apartment with the sum of approximately $4.5 million. And in 45 minutes, he did not attempt to clarify that for the benefit of Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, you had your time, San Fernando is. Again. Every member will be allowed to enter the debate. I will not tolerate the cross-talking. Proceed, Karini. Kuva South. Yes. Thank you, Madam, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And uh, during uh, his presentation, he pointed uh, in a number of directions and uh, spoke about the process of allocation of units and uh, that the middle income group in the society was crowded out and there was no concern for those at the lower 
end of the economic ladder during the tenure of the partnership government. And uh, he spoke about the cost of construction and Victoria Keys and Eden Gardens and providing uh, comfort to squatters and so on. And I want to, and I will address all of this, these issues that was raised by the Minister of Housing, because it is important to bring the facts to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. But as I stand here today, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I am deeply saddened because a constituent of mine, a young gentleman by the name of Mr. Nishad Mohammed, 25 years old, had a dream of acquiring a house. And unfortunately, his life was snuffed out in very tragic circumstances. And uh, his dream is no more. And I take the opportunity to extend condolences to him and uh, his entire family. And uh, the member for San Fernando East indicated that my colleague was an abysmal failure during his tenure as the Minister of Housing in Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Deputy Speaker. But after $110 billion being spent by the government of Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley and the PNM cabinet in two years, in two years, Mr. Deputy Speaker, everybody in this country has concluded that they are indeed an abysmal failure and uh, San Fernando East belongs to that group. <laughs> Yesterday, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I was perusing the news day of um, <coughs> Section A, page 3. And they said, uh, f the headline read, 50% say government doing a poor job. One in two people think the government is doing a poor job ma managing the economy, while only 10% think it is doing a good job according to market facts and opinion, consumer economic sentiment report, ma uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. One out of 10. Say. And this is the reality. So when uh, the member for San Fernando East has indicated or wants to go in the direction of speaking about failures and not dealing with the development of Trinidad and Tobago, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, what is his track record since he has assumed the responsibility of being the Minister of Housing? How, how what, after his delivery here and his budget presentation, and wherever he has speaking, uh, spoken, sorry, in Trinidad and Tobago, what has, what comfort has he brought to the people who are living under the poverty line in this country to tell them, to tell them that indeed the PNM is providing or will provide you with um, um, housing, Madam, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, from a cost point of view and uh, an affordable point of view, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I want to take the opportunity here to remind the member for San Fernando East of the track record of my colleague and the track record of the government which she belonged to. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is a fact that the People's Partnership Government, which was led by the Honorable Kamala Passad Bisesa, executed 7,130 housing starts and delivered 8,521 housing units in five years. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is important to note that during the PNM's tenure in office between 2002 to 2009, the PNM executed 13,047 housing starts, starts during the period 2002 to 2009, 
and delivered only. I want to reiterate mm -hmm. and delivered only 2,428 completed housing units in seven years. Look the difference in term, from a statistical point of view, mm -hmm. Mr. Deputy Speaker. 8,521 units in five years as opposed to 2,000 428 completed housing units in seven years. And then San Fernando East has the brass face to talk about um, uh, what being an abysmal failure. And uh, he wants to go in the direction of focusing, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, on the standard of work and the quality of work and so on that was delivered by the partnership government. But you see, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the PNM must always be reminded of their sins and what they, what they perpetrated on the population of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Deputy Speaker, because uh, again, I want to indicate, Mr. Deputy Speaker, as I said, the PNM spent more money and delivered less housing units in its accelerated housing program when compared to the People's Partnership. And uh, the country, the country San Fernando East must be reminded that there were thousands of empty housing units all across Trinidad and Tobago and the national outrage that was sparked and the amount of finances had to be um, redirected into completing all these tall housing sites. And from a remedial point of view, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the amount of money that was spent in addressing the issues of drainage, electrical, and plumbing infrastructure the PNM strategy, Mr. Deputy Speaker, was simply to build in phases and to allocate small percentages, especially close to election of completed housing unit with an incomplete phase. For example, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in Current Hills and San Fernando, a total of 736 units, approximately out of a total of 736 units, approximately 50 housing units were completed and allocated. The tragedy, the tragedy here, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the site was incomplete and it was without wastewater facilities. Human waste had to be pumped out of the development daily and the same had to be done in Retrench, in San Fernando, Las Alturas, Mova, Mendez, and Mendez Drive in Chamflair. Imagine you're building houses, you're building units, and you did not address the very important issue of waste treatment, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And they talk about caring about people. The bodily human function is very important for the health survival of any human being and uh, from that point of view how could you be so callous and so inconsiderate as a government to build houses and not have waste uh, wastewater uh, facilities and so on being built Mr. Deputy Speaker that is the track record of a government that cares about the people of Trinidad or cared about the people of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And that is why it is important that every time we on this side get an opportunity to deal with those on the other side, it is important to remind them of their sins and their failed policies and what they did in terms of on the people of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, the member for San Fernando East, again, 
a lot of, I wouldn't even use the term bravado, because it was really a, term, it was really a continuation on his part of a narrative that the PNM is trying to create in his society, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And uh, he focused on uh, Victoria Keys and the cost implications and so on, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And uh, he indicated that the movement in the cost for, in terms of in phase one, the contract cost was $119 million to $119,264,624.23. And Mr. Deputy Speaker, what he failed to tell this Honorable House and what he failed to tell Trinidad and Tobago is that when this was supposedly approved on the 7th of December 2005. There are no documents existing at the Housing Development Corporation that will give you a sense of understanding of who were the persons or what was the paper trail and the process as it relates to the awarding of that particular contract. And this is the legacy of the PNM. You talk a lot without giving any sub, um, supporting information or data. No. I am hopefully, I am reading. Member, I, I know that you are reading, but the displaying of the particular document. Proceed. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I am guided. I will hold it. You know, uh, if I put it a little low, I may have some difficulty in having to bend to read, so I seek your cooperation in lifting it at a certain level member. that will allow me to. Okay, okay, I, I heard you. But member, holding it up on this position is not in a reading position. So please proceed. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, I am guided, but you know, in the flow of things, sometimes they, with the hand movement and so on, it may reach at a certain level beyond. So, so Mr. De and you know where, where I've come from, uh, based on my previous experience, I like to articulate myself with, uh, with gesticulation and so on. So, Mr. Deputy Speaker, coming back to my colleague there on the opposite side from San Fernando East about trying to be sensationalist and continuing this narrative and propaganda on the part of the PNM that there was corruption and um, not proper procedures and so on in relation to um, the increase in the cost of construction as it relates to Victoria Keys, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It moved to $652,560,863.52 based on decisions of a board, decisions of the board of directors of the HDC on the 6th of March, 2012. And in this bundle, it is properly documented in relation to the process and so on. And at no time, any minister of government of the partnership was involved in the, in the award of the contracts in relation to the cost increases of um, Victoria Keys, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And it was, uh, for example, on the 6th of March, 2012, the description of works um, took into consideration the completion of the building works and redesign and so on. And as I said, it was done via a board note and minutes and so on and a proper board decision. And also on the 31st of August, 2014, again, via a board meeting and proper documentation and so on, which fo focus on 
external infrastructure, recreation, and car park works and so on, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Unlike, as I said, on previous occasions, one of an award of $119,264,624.33 and $153,718,824.59. Again, there is no paper trail existing at the AGC in relation to when, how, why, who, and so on, from a due process point of view, Madam, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So at the end of the day, we could speak because we were committed to the process, we were committed to transparency, and if you go into the, um, the records of the AGC, this bundle gives you a sense of comfort in terms of what was done in relation to Victoria Keys, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And uh, just for the records, uh, you know, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I don't know if at, at any point in time, Mr. Deputy Speaker, from the point of view of transparency and accountability and so on and good governance, whether the member for Diego Martin West will tell Trinidad and Tobago whether he tried to, through HGC, to obtain a unit at Victoria Keys. Mr. Deputy Speaker. So, and I say that um, the Speaker has returned and probably at some point in time, the Minister for Housing and San Fernando East may brief one of his colleagues to tell Trinidad and Tobago and to tell this house whether the member for Diego Martin West indeed got one of these units and so on. I don't know, Madam Speaker. I am simply asking the question. <laughs> Madam Speaker, and it is important too to continue to focus on the issues that have been brought into this particular motion, Madam Speaker. And again, he wants to, f I don't know what is the track record of the Minister of, the current Minister of Housing, and that is why I will pose this particular question also to him. Because you have to deal with the reality. You continue to speak about the government not having money and there's a financial squeeze and so on in Trinidad and Tobago. I see the Minister, the minister of Education is watching with a sense of uh, a focus as I make this particular point. And he knows, he knows why um, he's watching with a sense of focus. But uh, Mr. Madam, Dep Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, it is important for the minister to really display some kind of leadership at the Ministry of Housing and to indicate why, again, the government now has been more or less received a slap in the face, if I should use that phrase, in relation to the oral ruling that was delivered by um, Justice Quinlan Williams, who ruled that AGC was not entitled to pay the, a contractor in installments as it had not complied with the court rules required for, nor did the organization disclose its financial records to s support the application. Madam Speaker, it is important that from a leadership point of view, that ministers of government who continue because, if I could recollect, the Minister of Finance has stopped, was instructed that uh, no government monies be spent on Christmas parties and so on. But also ministers must display leadership. And if they know that cases will fail in the courts of Trinidad and Tobago at a time when they are complaining 
than mooning and groaning to workers in Trinidad and Tobago, contractors in Trinidad and Tobago, and so on, Madam Speaker, if they know that cases will fail in the courts of Trinidad and Tobago, why are they not stepping in and giving advice and leadership to save the taxpayers of this country, um, Madam Speaker? And uh, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, the minister, during his presentation, went in the direction, went in the direction of focusing on the aided self-help program. He focused on the land settlement agency and so on. And I want to ask the minister here this evening, Madam Speaker, because the Land for the Landless program, the Land for the Landless program was part of a vision of the People's Partnership Government. And when, under the leadership of Kamala Prasad Bisesa, Prime Minister at that time, and when we went to the population in 2015, uh, Madam Speaker, our manifesto indicated that we would have continued to develop this particular program. And uh, if I am to read and quote directly, in parallel, we will continue with our land for the landless program which provides subsidized lots to low and middle income families earning less than $8,000 per month. For those that earn less than $3,000 per month, we will provide additional support under the Foundation for Life program. And under this program, we will provide, in addition to the land, a concrete foundation on which a starter home can be built, Madam Speaker. That was the vision and to continue the work if the, we were returned to the government of Trinidad and Tobago. And Madam Speaker, up till today, during and after his presentation, no one has been properly supplied in relation to the information or the data or the statistics which would have guided the cabinet of Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley to scrap this particular program. What was the rationale why the cabinet arrived at this particular decision, Madam Speaker? Because, Madam Speaker, we must never forget that I want to remind the member for San Fernando East that on the 22nd of May 2013, that, and I'm reading from the Trinidad Newsday uh, article, Madam Speaker, that the first drawing of 500 residential lots took place and 500 applicants were selected and they sucked in terms of being uh, via the uh, random lottery draw and to um, be the recipients or beneficiaries of the lot allotment. And at the end of the day, the member attempted to make heavy weather of the, not a lot being distributed. And anybody who is logical in their thinking will know that if you have to distribute lots too, you have to develop the lands. And it was a work in progress. And that is why it was clearly stated in our manifesto, Madam Speaker. And uh, Madam Speaker, this government has signaled that it wants to rewrite the history of Trinidad and Tobago. In fact, the prime minister of this country has said that he would recruit the services of a historian to rewrite the history of Trinidad and Tobago. I'm trying to remember the name, Dr. Theodore Lewis. And uh, I am, because I want to pose a number of questions as it relates to this aided self-help program, which the minister 
indicated, and uh, headlines have been reading in the oh, oh, headlines are in the newspapers of this country, and citizens are reading that HDC lots will be ready by March, and 10,000 people have downloaded application form for pre-approved lots. And also that the self aided self-help program will take into consideration pre-approved lots, technical assistance in obtaining uh, approvals and so on, and assisting in the supplying of a, po a pool of small contractors and so on. I don't know if you would have to qualify via party card to become part of the pool of pre-qualified contractors and so on. And that is the direction of rewriting the history of Trinidad and Tobago. And also, I also, uh, Madam Speaker, we are not being told because as I said, I read from two articles here one dated the 22nd of May, uh, 2013, and one on the 21st of May, 2014, Madam Speaker. And the headlines are concentrated on the numbers. In one instance, 500 residential lots, and in the other instance, land for 500 more. And up till now, Madam Speaker, while the program has been scrapped from the point of view of a cabinet decision, the minister or nobody in the government on that side, even during the budget debate, could clarify what has become of the persons who qualified or who were selected under the Land for the Landless program. Will they be given preferential treatment in the what we would call the aided self-help housing program? No, um, you had your time, Mark, and I allow me to put this into the domain, and if you have the opportunity through one of your colleagues and for the benefit of all to clarify this particular issue for the benefit of those who, were, who would have qualified under the um, Land for the Landless program, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, and then he went into the direction of the development of lands for the ex carini workers, Madam Speaker. And again, again, they have not developed any new site. They have not developed one lot after spending $110 billion in the service of Trinidad and Tobago, Madam Speaker. And The original speaking time is now spent. You're entitled to 15 more minutes to complete if you wish. You may proceed. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I will avail myself of all. And Madam Speaker, the most important thing, I think, for because I know they want to rewrite the history of uh, Trinidad and Tobago and the fact that, and the fact that ex carini workers got or received lands and uh, 5,000, uh, over 6,000 from an agricultural point of view, and 2,000 plus from a residential point of view. That is a cause of concern. It is a cause of concern. And I want today to ask, the, through, through you, Madam Speaker, the member for San Fernando East, Madam Speaker, Lands which have been identified for the ex Kiarini workers. I am seeking clarification. I cast no aspersion, and I am coming to no conclusion. But for the benefit of the ex Kiarini workers, whether the lands that have already been developed for, the, for their benefit based on a judgment of Justice Lennox D. Alsing in the courts of Trinidad and Tobago, Madam Speaker, whether the PNM government of Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley is going in a direction of taking approximately 1,000 plots of 
land from a residential point of view, which are supposed to be given to ex carney workers at sites um, located in Hermitage, McBean, Picton, Factory Road, and Orange Field, and so on, Madam Speaker. That is the most fundamental issue for, from the point of view of the former employees of the company, and I'm sure the trade union, the all trade general workers trade union that I was proud to lead at one point in time, yes. Madam Speaker. And up till today, up till today, and I thought he would have used the opportunity to, to indicate to these ex carney workers who are, are looking forward to the continued delivery of their residential and agricultural lands to come to uh, an end, the minister failed miserably in relation to uh, providing information with this particular issue, Madam Speaker. And Madam Speaker, I want to take the opportunity here to deal with the ordinary people, because as I said, he has provided no sense of comfort to those who are earning in and around the minimum wage, those who are living under the poverty line in Trinidad and Tobago. And I want to remind the member for San Fernando East, probably it was by divine intervention, I don't know, but there is a lady who lives in Indian Trail who is still stupsing. <laughs> Madam, Madam Speaker, she's still stupsing because yesterday, and I'm in possession, and I want to read for the minister to listen. I hope that when I'm finished, he's not, he will not stoop, but he will get down to relieving the plight of this ordinary citizen in his society. Madam Speaker, it's dated the 23rd of September, November 2017. And for the records, because you know you all like to engage in people fabricating and so on. Mary Amy Parrier, uh, um, ID number 1957080917, who was born in Indian Trail. Yes, sir, and it is addressed to me as the Member of Parliament because she walked into my office, constituency office yesterday. Yes, sir, I am a homeless citizen of Trinidad and Tobago. As it has been highlighted in many newspapers across Trinidad and Tobago, I am a human being after all. I humbly request you as a member of parliament who has written on previous occasions to ministers of housing to act on my behalf and to, to assist me, which has gone to no avail. Words, I am still homeless. I am still living in the hospital. I beg that you use your voice and seek pity on me as meetings with the minister were futile I wish that you highlight this issue so I'm, I may be able to get some sort of assistance, um, Madam Speaker. Regards, Mary Paria. Madam Speaker, that is the lady who um, the minister, again, with a bit of contempt and arrogance when the poor, humble citizen of Trinidad and Tobago attempted to engage him, all he could have responded with with a loud stoop, rather than say, you reminded me of the Diana Powerman advertisement, Madam Speaker. They could probably recruit him to advertise Diana Powerman. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, I thought that they belong to our government, we care, and let's this, do this together, and so on. If I was in his position at that point in time, I would have embraced that lady, offered an arm of comfort, and attempted to use my staff, whether from the point of view of personal assistant or whoever within the system, to offer some sense of guidance and direction and so on. Mr. M Madam Speaker, the minister has failed miserably, and certainly that will be his legacy in terms of stupsing to the ordinary people of Trinidad and Tobago, Madam uh, Speaker. And Madam Speaker, he speaks about dealing with the system and providing uh, 
a certain care and uh, uh, programs and so on for the ordinary and poor people of Trinidad and Tobago, Madam Speaker. And people have given me documentation, they have given me permission to call their names because the system at HDC and the system at TTMF is broken, Mr. Minister, based on your incompetence and your lack of leadership. And uh, I want to read again, um, addressed to me, again, people always come to uh, the constituency office and they are pained by what this government is doing, what, how they are inflicting trauma and pain. And uh, uh, a person, re uh, I applied, this is the, f the, the following is a summary of what took place on the day of my interview at AGC, which was the 15th of September, 2017. And I just, I don't want to, it is really personal, but I want to read I, the last paragraph of Ms. Babwa's statement to me. I regret to say that I was in utter disappointment and in shock to see that a system that was originally implemented for the lesser fortunate, the lesser fortunate citizen of this country was no longer for them at all, but uh, a strategy that is being pursued by the government to rob the poor people of Trinidad and Tobago, Madam Speaker. And in 2017, in 2017, the member for San Fernando East has done nothing to change, to change how the poor people feel when they go into AGC and so on. And uh, I also have one, and I'm asking the minister, because again, this is a personal matter involving divorce and a very traumatic experience and so on, um, Mr. Minister. And uh, again, the citizens and taxpayers of this country, Mr. S Mr. Minister, feel that the income figures, in terms of the interest figures, at the uh, Trinidad and Tobago Trinidad and Tobago mortgage finance is being manipulated in terms of after they get their initial mortgage and so on, uh, they are being asked to subject themselves to valuation and so on. And uh, based on the valuation of the property, their uh, mortgages are increasing based on the increase in uh, the interest rates. And I'm, as I am saying to you, this is people who are coming to me at my constituency office. And I have an obligation to deal with this particular issue. And that is why I am saying that also, whilst you come here to demonize uh, contractors who are providing employment and focusing on the development of Trinidad and Tobago from the uh, importance of the construction sector, you must also address the systems uh, that are currently existing at the agencies under your jurisdiction. Because as you said, and you continue to boast, that it is not only about building homes, it is about construct, uh, what affordability, accessibility, and um, some other uh, uh, word that you like to parrot without delivering, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, so I am pleading with you based on the poor and humble and ordinary citizens that you all have abandoned in two years, in two years, to try and address the, uh, the deficiencies in the system in relation to how people feel when they visit the HDC and when they visit the um, Trinidad and Tobago mortgage finance, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, housing is very important to all and sundry, Madam Speaker. The human right to adequate housing is, as we would know, is also enshrined in international law and it is enshrined in the very constitution of Trinidad and Tobago. And yes, to underline the importance, Madam Speaker, of how the framers of our constitution looked at the whole question of housing in Trinidad and Tobago, if I am to go to chapter one, the recognition and recognition of fundamental human rights and freedoms. Um, it is enshrined, as I said, for A, the right of the individual to life, liberty, security of the person and enjoyment of property 
and the right not to be deprived thereof except by due process of law. And in 4D, it states the right of the individual to, to equality of treatment from any other public authority in the exercise of any, in the exercise of any function. Madam Speaker, as I said, it is in recognized by international law, the United Nations and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It is embedded in our very constitution, Madam Speaker. And uh, I just want to, because I've, never, I've not heard really anything substantial from the point of view of a policy and whether a housing policy and whether the government is prepared to even go uh, a greater or a bolder step by examining the possibility of uh, legislating our housing policy and so on, Madam Speaker. And I want to guide the goodly uh, minister, for example, in uh, some countries, Madam Speaker, for example, in the Republic of South Africa, has the, enshrined the right to adequate uh, housing in its constitution in 1966 with respect to uh, Finland, it makes it mandatory, Madam Speaker, for local government authorities to provide housing resources for the severely handicapped, for the severely handicapped under certain circumstances, Madam Speaker. And today, I ask the minister what has become of the policy that the partnership government ensured when we were there for five years to allocate a certain amount or a quota for physically challenged members of our society in relation to housing acquisition, Madam Speaker. And my colleague is advising me that um, members of the physically challenged society, they have been evicted. And again, Madam Speaker, if, Madam Speaker, that in itself tells me of the continued lack of care the continued lack of empathy on the part of those on the other side. Madam Speaker, and uh, for example, just to provoke some thought uh, from those on the other side, in the Republic of South Korea, the Housing Construction Promotion Act of 1972 calls for the provision of the construction and supply of dwelling units for persons who lack housing, and the Act number 1493 of 1993 in Bolivia mandates the Ministry of Human Development to promote the construction of subsidized housing, Madam Speaker. So in that regard, Madam, Madam Member for Kuva South, your speaking time is now spent. Member for Love until West. Thank you very, very, very much, Madam Speaker, for recognizing me to make a short contribution in this very important debate. Madam Speaker, I recognize immediately the difficulty of my friends on the other side. Just like in the business of education, in the business of housing in Trinidad and Tobago from our beginnings as a nation, the PNM has led the way. We have blazed the trail. And my friends on the other side are attempting to play catch up. That is their first problem. The next problem they have is that the sincerity of purpose with which we have approached the business of education and housing and all aspects of the governance of this country, they have no such element of sincerity. Theirs is about contracts and money for friends and family. So they will always, they will, they will always have a problem. They will always have a problem. Member for Love, until West, please continue. My friend from Coover South, he spoke ad nauseum about Karani Lots. I remember the member for Oropooch standing in this house to tell us in answer to a question I think I filed when I was a senator. He told this country that they were spending $700,000 to develop one lot of those Karani lands. 
and that they were selling them for $50,000, and that was part of their difficulty. He's on record as saying that, the member for Urupuch. And I'm now learning at this stage, Madam Speaker, after all of that, $8 billion as my friend, the member for San Fernando East, who I must compliment publicly for a very potent, for a very potent response to non-presentation by the member for Urupuj. It was disappointing in the extreme. He told all elements of the media he was coming to drop bombs here today. He was like a damp squid. <laughs> Dead. <laughs> Broken at the wrist. Broken at the wrist. He should have gone to St. Lucia for that. <laughs> again. He should have gone to St. Lucia again with that. But, Madam Speaker, I am to learn today very sadly to the detriment of the people of Trinidad and Tobago that these very lots at those exorbitant costs that they concocted to the people's disadvantage cannot be delivered to them because no approvals have been obtained. None. And my friend from representing Kuva South, he spoke ad nauseum about this. But he, as a former union leader who represented most of those people who were looking forward to those lots and cannot now enjoy them, they don't want to hear him. He betrayed them. I thank you warmly. He even made mention of a citizen. I have not met the lady, but I have read about her. Some Mary Pariah. My friend, the Minister of Housing, tells me that the record reveals that there's some other kind of problem because she was issued with three HDC houses over time. Three. three. And recently we had a situation where a family took up residence quite unlawfully, quite improperly, and the government responded very patiently to a situation opposite President's house. And I'm, le I'm to learn from my friend, the member for St. San Fernando East, that that citizen as well was the beneficiary of four HDC houses and kept moving from time to time. But my friends on the other side, they would jump on cases like Mary Pariah and the example I have just given you outside of President's house in their effort to seek political popularity among the people. Dishonorable indeed. As for the question of land for land, let's just to get the perspectives right. The program was launched by, my by, by the member for Oropuich East and the UNC in government in 2012. It was a residential lots program. They promised that they would put foundation starter houses for people. <laughs> but by March 2013, the member for, Oropu the member for Oropuich East went to the cabinet and had those lots transferred to the EMBD. He must tell us why. And the EMBD is a very special place when it comes to the member for Orupuch East. It was his, on, it was his, it, 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 it provided him with a lot of lift and it made very well provide him with his undoing. Time will tell. Madam Speaker, the records in Trinidad and Tobago will show that the HDC, formerly the NHA, has in its purview some 55,778 units. It's a serious program because we understand the importance of housing to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. From the days of self-help housing, you know, the first self-help housing development in the history of this country was done in the constituency of Laventil, East Mova in the MOVA area, and I know the person who got the first key. I can't remember his name now, but I had the honor to meet him. He's now passed, handed over by a man called Gerard Montano. We have housing estates all over Trinidad and Tobago from far west to far east to far south, and I have a list of them here. We have 281 housing estates in this country, all developed by the PNM over very many years. And I need not belabor the point and list them. They are all here for all to see. That is our record in housing. Well, as for my friend, the member for Orupuchist. 
As I said to you earlier, his presentation today was abysmal. But it had to be because he's jiggery. <laughs> he's not thinking straight. He's seeing himself in strange places, in strange circumstances. Because something is happening. Confined spaces. Yes. Strange and possibly confined places. I'm shaking. Yes. Yes, you are. Yes, and you will get shaken too. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the motion, the motion states, be it resolved that the House take note of the continuing failure of the government to implement a viable housing policy to provide affordable housing units to qualified and deserving citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. I particularly like the intervention of my friend from San Fernando East, who told us that it should have been rearranged a little bit, because it is quite clear it is quite clear that the focus, and I agree with my friend from San Fernando East, the focus of the contribution for Orupuch East had to do with the auditing aspects of HDC. It wasn't so much about building and distribution. He spent a lot of time expressing his deep concerns about the auditing, that someone is looking at what had happened. And he's very, very, very worried about that. And I can understand his trouble. And I too would suggest to him, save your fire, save it for air conditioned room in the Hall of Justice. Don't bring it here. This is the, this is the forum for the people's business, not your personal troubles. That you choreograph because of your innate tendencies. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I have to remind the country, my friend enunciated it, but I must remind the people of Trinidad and Tobago to whom we speak, that they spent $8 billion over the five years. $8 billion in the housing program. In days when we had plenty, they started 5,000, I'm so sorry. Honorable Member, for Orpuch East, if you'd like to make an, an intervention, as a senior member here, I'm sure you know the proper way to do it. Please. It's part of the problem with jiggery, madam. <laughs> jumpy. <laughs> yes, jumpy, nervous. His sins may have caught up with him. <laughs> madam Speaker, and he's taking comfort. He's taking comfort telling us across the floor is a civil case. Okay, okay, all the, you know, civil cases have their implications too, you know. Yes. Madam Speaker, as I was saying before, the member for Oropuch East attempted to distract me. They spent $8 billion in the five years and three months in their housing program. They started 5,480 units and delivered 1,800 of them. The PNM, in contradistinction, between the years 2002 and 2009, we delivered 4,022 housing units to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Yep. And recently, documents came before us in the cabinet, and we were able to see on paper, in truth and in fact, the substantial difference in the expenditure to have done 4,027 housing units. Chalk and cheese. They had all the cheese and they behave like rats too. I, it is a metaphor. I didn't say anybody was a rat. Member for Karini, member for Karini East and member for Coover South. You all are consistently disturbing my ability to listen to Laventil West. And I really would ask you all to desist. Member for Laventil West, I would really like you to find another way to see that. Please withdraw it. I'm sorry. I withdraw that metaphor. I withdraw that metaphor, Madam Speaker. Let me proceed. Madam Speaker, and from 2016, so the present time, we delivered 1,900 houses to people, the citizens of this country. And that program continues with far less resources. But it has to do with responsible government governance. It has to do with responsible management. 
It has to do with sound leadership, and it has to do with the abs absence of an ethos, an ethic, that is about getting, getting, getting things that are not yours. That is what the last regime represented as far as I'm concerned. And of course, and of course, my colleague from San Fernando East asked a question that will remain unanswered. How is it that the Victoria Keys, that wonderful development down there, how did it escalate from $200 million to $600 million? We watched in agony from the benches of the opposition. We had started that development for the benefit of the people in those communities and others in the, in the constituency of Diego Martin Central. And we saw them stand there cold and idle for months and perhaps years. And then when they went back to it, they gutted it out. They converted two bedrooms to one bedroom and three bedrooms to two bedroom. They upscaled it, obviously, with ulterior intentions. And they pushed the price of that construction to $600 million and then has, have the temerity to come here today to question how people got them. We, when those units were completed, they could no longer serve the people for whom they were originally intended. So the government retained a few for its own use, as has been done for decades in this country, in Flagstaff and Federation Park. So when we have dignitaries and other people and ministers who need to occupy them, we do that. That's responsible management. And the large majority of them are now being put on the open market for those who want to purchase them. That's how we handle that. So, Madam Speaker, questions were raised again about this question of Ropsing Road. They started out at $103,000 for the development of a lot. The UNC took it, yes, I know where it is. The UNC, I know where everything is. The UNC, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did the cross talk. Honorable members, it's now 4.30. We shall now take the suspension and resume at 5 p.m.